Jai Gurdiv, Jai Masters. Eventually, you reach a point in your growth, in your life, where you realize what's going on inside of you is what matters. Your inner state is what determines the environment in which you live. It wouldn't matter what was going on outside of you if you were disturbed inside. When you're disturbed inside, the outside is disturbing. When you're at peace, in harmony, feeling well-being inside, then the outside is fine. Your only conflict and issue with the outside is because of the inside. When you are not well inside, you try to use the outside to make you better. When it behaves, you like it. When it doesn't behave, you don't like it. And all of life is defined by that relationship. While you are not well inside, you demand things of people, places, and things in order to make it easier and better for you. This is so common, it's so natural, that it's almost trite to even talk about. The problem is nobody does talk about it. That is seen as normal. It is seen as normal that if you are not well and disturbed and having problems inside, that you would struggle with the outside, people, places, and things, to get them the way you need them so that you feel better inside. The trouble is, it may be normal, but it's not healthy, and it leads to nothing but distraught. If there is a problem inside, it must be fixed inside. It cannot be fixed outside. Not only can one say it should not be fixed outside, one has a right to say it cannot be fixed outside. Something which is inside is inside. The outside can affect it. They are interrelated. There is energy passing back and forth between the outside and the inside. But the outside cannot solve the inside. It's like if you have a broken leg, a crutch doesn't fix it. It's helpful, it's an aid, it's a temporary situation, but it's not going to fix your broken leg. It's not going to do anything to fix your broken leg. Your broken leg has something to do with your body. The crutch has to do with trying to give you support while your leg is broken. It does not fix the leg. The outside world is a crutch. The outside world is a support structure trying to support you while you have a problem inside. It's good to look at this closer because it's hard to believe people miss that. So, for example, you're lonely inside. You feel loneliness. You feel a lack of well-being. You feel rejection. You feel a lack of self-worth. These are not outside things. These are inside things. You feel them inside of you. So, you go out and try to have a relationship with somebody. You try to get a better job. You try to do something that will make people proud of you. You do something so that the outside situation changes to be more supportive of your inner problem. Will it solve your inner problem? There's the great breakthrough. It doesn't ever solve your inner problem. It doesn't ever solve your inner problem. If you have insecurity, fear, a lack of self-worth, and a lacking of love, and you try to find things outside of you that help to fulfill this, that help to take care of this, that help to make this more bearable and less burdensome, one, you may not find anything, and then you're not dealing with your inner problem. Your problem becomes, I can't find somebody outside. If somebody says, how are you doing? I'm not doing so well. Why? Well, I can't find the right person for me. You don't say, because I have a problem in my heart, You don't say, because I have psychological problems and I don't like myself. That's not what you say. You say, I can't find anybody. No one will hire me for a new position. So-and-so got the raise. Your problem is being defined as outside when really the outside was just an attempt to find a solution for what was wrong inside of you. So you're not even working on what's wrong inside of you. You're working on what you think will be the solution to what's wrong inside of you, and that's too removed. So if you can't find something, then you have a problem for sure. But the reality is, even if you do find something, you have a problem. If you should find somebody who makes you feel better inside, wait till you see how attached you get. Wait till you see how much need develops inside of you. 
In essence, it's almost as though all of these disturbed energies that were insecurity, lack of self-worth, emptiness, loneliness, etc., that all of those energies that were the problem now feed another problem. They become the core, the source of a problem of possessiveness, jealousy, attachment, need. It's need. It transforms into need. It was loneliness. It was insecurity. It was a lack of a sense of well-being. Now you don't feel it like that. You feel it as clinging. You feel it as worrying. You feel it as grabbing another person. You feel it as all the neat, disturbing stuff that comes up inside of people when they are in a needy relationship. And they start to feel jealousies and insecurities and disturbance because of how somebody treats them or how somebody doesn't treat them. All of this stuff inside gets turned into a problem with the relationship outside. And you end up working on the relationship with the other party instead of working on yourself. You go to all these situations, all these growth situations take place. And if you can hold on to the buck and bronco of what's going on during those relationships... Maybe the relationship lasts, but the net is what you're working on is the crutch. Maybe the crutch isn't breaking. Maybe you can support yourself better. You're not working on the broken leg. You are not working on the cause of the problem, which was your inner disturbance. You're working on that which manages to keep you afloat despite the fact that you have the inner disturbance. Somebody could question... Well, how do you know that it didn't solve it? Well, one way you know is when the person leaves you. If you were lonely, insecure, and lack of self-worth, and in need of love, and then you found somebody or something, you went through this little dance, and four months later they ran off with somebody else and left you a note, obviously, now that you solved your problem of lack of self-worth and need of love and hollowness, you're just going to feel ecstasy about the whole thing, because at least you fixed all your problems. And the answer is that's not what's going to happen. You're going to feel more lack of self-worth, more emptiness, where you'll say, I wish I never got in that relationship. I'm worse than I was before. Because it didn't solve it. Because it won't solve it. Because it can't solve it. You weren't even using it to solve it. You were using it as a crutch. You were using it to support yourself in spite of the fact that you had these problems inside. It's not just relationships. We do the same thing with money. We do the same thing with security, financial security. You have fear about what's going to happen in the future. and Will you be okay? And what's enough? And a lot of anxiety exists about life. So instead of solving that anxiety, people don't realize it's not natural to be anxious about the future. That's a sickness, just like any other sickness. The future will always exist. It has existed for billions of years. It just keeps unfolding. That's just what it does. And you will experience it. That's what will happen. You will be here to experience the future. To be anxious about it is unhealthy. And it's not natural. And there shouldn't be that anxiety. But that's not what people say when they feel anxiety about their finances in the future. What they do is say, what do I do about it? I'm going to keep the broken leg... I wouldn't even define it as a broken leg. It's just been that way for a long time since I fell from the tree. Net result is now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and find financial situations, this, that, just do all that stuff to try to do what? To try to be able to lighten the burden of carrying the anxiety about the future. Does it work? The answer is no. And if you sit there and ask somebody who makes $5,000 a year, does it work? They'll say no. If you ask somebody who makes $50,000 a year, ask them, does it work? They'll say no. If you ask somebody who earns $500,000 a year, does it work? They'll say no. And if you ask somebody who earns $5 million a year, does it work? They'll say no. Period. I guarantee you, they think about money more than you do. They spend more time anxious about their investments, about this, about that, about what's going on. And it doesn't ever stop. It doesn't ever stop. No matter what it is, kings that own kingdoms, worried about losing them. It's just an amazing thing. Why? Because of what I said to start with. Your problem is inside. It cannot and will not be solved 
by doing things outside. So all that effort to find a crutch, a support structure, so you can carry the weight of what's wrong inside, is misguided energy. If you would just take, imagine how much effort you do with all of this, (laughs) all the stuff we're talking about, the finances, the relationships, all these things, just an attempt to be okay. If instead it was reasonably taught to people that you can solve these problems inside of you, they are not part of you. They're just like a sickness, like your body can get sick. When your body gets sick, not one of you, if you get a flu or a cold or a stomach ache, not one of you think, oh, how am I going to live with this? Maybe I need to rebuild the house to get the bathroom closer to the bed because I keep having to go. It's not working well and so on. And I guess I better quit my job because there's no way I can keep this job while I have a stomach ache like this. And, you know, relationships not working really well. I'm not feeling really close. I, I, I'd rather sleep alone. Move out. Is that what you do when you get a stomach ache? You say, no, I'm going to fix this. You don't say, I'm going to keep this and adjust my life around the fact that now I'm sick. That's what it is. The first thing you do when you get sick is say, I don't want to be sick. I'm going to a doctor. Why? Because I don't want to be sick. I'm going to fix it. You believe it's fixable. Do you believe your feeling of lack of love? Do you feel your feeling of insecurity? Do you feel your feeling of anxiety about finances and about the future are fixable? In most people's cases, no. They think it's avoidable. They think they can downplay it. They think they can do things to make it more tolerable. But people don't understand that that is just a sickness inside the same as your body would get sick. It is not something you should be living with. It is not something you should be adjusting to. It is not something that in any way, shape, or form you should be building your life around the fact that I'm just like that. I've always been like that. I'm insecure. I'm an insecure person. The net result is Any disturbance you have inside of you is a sickness and is not supposed to be like that. What's it supposed to be like inside? You know what it's supposed to be like for your body. You know what it feels like to be healthy. You know what it feels like to have a good relationship with your body. It basically feels like it works. It does what you tell it to do and it's not in your way and you're kind of having fun together. That's what your inner state is supposed to feel like. That is the natural state of your inner state. What is the natural state of the human heart, of the true heart? What you feel as love when you first meet somebody and you, you're really compatible and you just love being in each other's presence and you feel that warmth come up inside of you and kind of flow out of your heart towards somebody, you know, that nice stage that's hard to keep but you've had it before, that is the natural state of your human heart. And it does not require another person to feel that. That is what is supposed to be happening out of that chakra, out of the fourth center of energy, is the energy is supposed to be coming up and flowing out through that center so that you're always being fed, so that you always feel love, no matter where you are, no matter how anybody's treating you, no matter what's going on, you are feeling sustained and supported by this flow of energy. What about your solar plexus, your anxiety center, your tension anxiety center? It's not supposed to be doing that. It's supposed to feel strength. It's supposed to feel enthusiasm. Like any task you face, energy comes up in your hara, in your power center, and you feel all this strength about doing it. And you have to hold yourself back, right? It's like like a kid doesn't know any better. It just wants to do it. It wants to get involved in it. It's driven toward expression and creativity. That's the natural flow of the creative energies inside of you. They don't require anything. They don't require any special place to go or someone to be with, or it has to be this particular way because it turns me off that way. No, no, that's just like your body. I know I can't go there because I have allergies. And Well, that's it's okay. I, I appreciate it, but it can be fixed. Even allergies can be fixed. It's not really exactly something you should be living with and adjusting your entire life around. If you are not feeling fulfillment wholeness, completeness in your different centers then what you're feeling is lacking. And what you feel is lacking in your chakras and these different energy centers, humans describe as, I feel so empty, I feel so scared, I feel so insecure. These are lack of energies. These are words that we use to describe lack of energy. It's like it's really funny. Our words really mess us up. If I had wind 
a gentle wind, a stronger wind, a much stronger wind, and finally an extremely strong wind blowing past you. If you were smart, you would say to me, God, I feel different levels of wind blowing past me. If you were not so smart, you'd sit there and say that the gentle wind is love. I feel love. And then the wind that's a little bit stronger is I feel anxious. That's anxious. And the wind that's really strong, I I feel like panicked and scared to death. You're giving names to the experience you're having. You're breaking them up into all these little pieces and calling them separate, calling them different things. It gets very confusing when you do that. It's much more reasonable to say there's wind and it blows different levels and makes me feel different things. It is the same thing inside of you. There's energy flowing inside of you. When it flows totally and wholly and completely, you feel fulfillment. You feel upliftment. You feel enthusiasm, all words, but they are words describing a strong energy flow, an upward-moving energy flow. When the energy is not flowing well, you feel a lack of energy. That lack of energy is what you call depression. That lack of energy is what you call hollowness from the heart. That lack of energy is what you feel is weakness and fear that drop out from under you, so you don't want to engage in anything because you don't feel the strength going on. They are just like the wind. You give too many names to things. Eventually you come down to either the energy is flowing well or the energy is not flowing well and that's the end of it. Don't give a whole lot of other names to the tiny little manifestations of what the experience is like when the energy is not flowing well versus the experience when the energy is flowing. And eventually it just comes down to realizing that's all that's going on inside of me. That's all. I can give a billion names to it if I want Or I can say, there is energy inside of me. When it is flowing up and in and out strong, that is the positive experience. That's my enthusiasm. That's my creativity. That's love. That's high. That's spirit. Call it what you want. (laughs) Call it any name. It goes by a billion different names. But what it is, is high, up, strong, beautiful, expressive. When it is lacking, it is the opposite. And you stop using all the words. And so eventually it comes down to what's the weather like right now in there? How's the wind doing? And you look at it and you describe it. And instead of saying that you need outer situations to change the flow of your energy, that's all you're dealing with, you realize it's your energy. It's inside of you. You want to work with it. You can find out why sometimes it's flowing and sometimes it's not flowing. Or you can run out after crutches to try and compensate for the fact that it's not flowing well. And what you end up with is more burden than you started with. You end up with this tremendous process of having to manipulate people, places, and things in order for you to be relatively okay. But you're not okay. You know it. You know at any moment something can go wrong. You know at any moment somebody can say something and it'll disturb you. Next thing you know, you're in trouble. You're not doing well. So the yogi, yogini, The truly spiritual person is a person who wakes up to this and says, that's what I want to work on. I want to work on my inner energy flow. It's all that matters anyways. If my inner energy flow is flowing beautifully, life is beautiful. If it's not, life is not. And it will never be otherwise. The neatest part is when you first realize that you can work on your inner energy flow. It's yours. It's just like anything else. You can work on your body. You can affect how healthy you are. Your diet affects it. Your exercise affects it. All kinds of things affect it. It's not like you have to leave it up to the bacteria. It's depending on how healthy you are and how well you keep your body. The bacteria may or may not bother it. You know, it has the ability to fight it off. It is the same thing with your inner energy flow. You do not have to be at the whim of your moods. You do not have to be the whim of depressions and loving one person and not another and liking something and getting all uptight. Not a single thing like that should be affecting your life. It's your energy, just like it's your body. And if you want to work with it, you can do more things with your energy flow inside than you can do with your body outside. And you do a lot with your body outside. (laughs) You measure everything now and you check cholesterols and blood pressures and 800 billion things to try and keep your body healthy. What do you do to keep your energy flow healthy? Ultimately, I'll tell you, and you know I don't usually talk like this, if you took all the practices of yoga the asanas, the malas, the japa, every single process of yoga, 
every single one of them is about working on your inner energy flow. Yoga is not exercise. Hatha yoga is not exercise. It is not about keeping your body limber. It is not about that. And what's neat is even people who approach yoga for that reason find out that it's more than that. Because yoga was devised and developed in order to work with your inner energy flow. The point is, you have the ability, if you want to, to completely change and affect the change of your inner energy flow. And the thing to remember is, how is it now? Well, all you have to do is watch. It's very sensitive. It changes all the time. It can't handle different situations. It's got soft spots. Somebody pushes a button, all of a sudden you freak out. There's all kinds of stuff going on in there. You can't even have certain thoughts. Certain thoughts, it gets all weird in there, doesn't it? In other words, it's sick. If your body was that way that you couldn't touch certain parts of your body, you'd go to a doctor or couldn't go somewhere or all kinds of issues were going on environmentally with your body. You wouldn't like it. Why do you tolerate that with your energy body? And so eventually you wake up and you say, I'm not going to. I don't want any more moods. I don't want any more ups and downs and swings and likes and dislikes and all the commotion inside. If I had my preference, it would always be up. It would always be enthusiastic. It would always feel love. It would always drive upwards and inwards instead of hollow and down and out. And once you determine that you are capable of having that experience and that there are methodologies for working with your energy, eventually it becomes the entire purpose of your life. You will realize that. Since it was the purpose of your life anyways, in the sense that all you were doing was going outside, trying to find people, places, and things that would help your energy flow, eventually you get to the point of saying, why don't I just do it directly? Why don't I just work on my energy flow? You didn't give anything up. You're doing the same thing you always did. All of your finances, all of your relationships, all of every single thing you did was to try and get the energy flow flowing better so you felt better. If you now just work directly on your energy flow, you will have a billion times, a billion times better results. doesn't mean you don't have an outer life. The outer life unfolds naturally. The only difference is you don't have all that need. You don't have all that attachment. You don't have all that grabbing because your starting position is that you're fine inside yourself. So how do you work with your energy? It's always a neat question. I think it's mostly neat because nobody teaches it. Once you realize that your whole life is about the energy flow and that you went through all of school and nobody even told you you had an energy flow, even though you did, <laughs> especially in school, all right? There was all these different changes going on inside and nobody did anything about them. Working with your energy flow is actually very, very easy. All it requires is that that's what you want. You have to have caught on that a high and even and healthy energy flow is the nectar of life. Imagine if you could wake up in the morning, every single morning, and just be filled with joy, just be filled with enthusiasm to go attack the day, to go see what's going to happen. Every single morning. Not, oh, what did I do, and what's going to happen there, and dread of this, and fear of that, and anxiety, and all. No, no, just enthusiasm like a kid, all right? Just wake up. Be a good way to start the day. And if all day, every day, that's what drove you. Just the love of life. Just the joy of interacting with life and things around you. And then when you put your head down at night, there was not a thing in your mind. Nothing. Nothing to think about. Nothing to go over. Nothing to feel bad about. Just another beautiful day of interacting with life took place. And you go to sleep. And every single day is this new journey of awakening and of experience. And that's all that goes on. And no matter what happens to you, no matter what presents itself to you, no matter what it is, it's just an opportunity to do a different kind of dance. You just see your whole life as an interaction, a dance with life. And you dance fast dances and slow dances and this dance and that dance. It doesn't make any difference. They're all fun. So whereas somebody else says these are positive experiences, these are negative experiences, you don't. You say that these are fast dances and these are slow dances. These are jazz and this is blues. And you're just dancing to different vibrations until you learn that all of it can be enjoyable. All of it, if you're open 
and you embrace it and welcome it, all of it can be a beautiful experience. So to get your energy that way, the first thing you have to do is want it to be that way. You have to want that more than you want to mess around with the things outside. Because you put a tremendous amount of energy into the things outside. So you realize it's not going to do what you want. doesn't mean you renounce them or not deal with them. It's just not the primary focus of your life. The primary focus of your life is working and raising your energy flow. Once that becomes what you want more than anything else in life, you're going to find that you're sitting inside and you will notice the changes that are happening in your energy flow. You will notice that sometimes your heart opens and sometimes it closes. You notice that sometimes your mind is noisy and sometimes it's quiet. You notice sometimes you feel attracted and other times you feel repulsed. Sometimes you feel enthused and sometimes you feel depressed. That's how it is. You'll notice that. Once you start noticing, it scares you because you think there's something wrong with you. You don't realize it's always been like that. You just never noticed. (laughs) You were too busy trying to do something about it to notice it. It's like panicking or freaking. And when you panic and freak, you can't see it. But once it becomes what you want to deal with, then you will sit there and you will notice what's going on in there. Once you're able to sit in there and notice, which is your first prerequisite for true growth, and you will notice that it's not easy to stay in there when different things are happening, that the energy almost has a power in and of itself, and that when it starts to go toward fear and it starts to go toward anger or it starts to go toward attraction or repulsion, that it has this very beautiful, magical pull on you, that it's like... It's hard for you to sit there when it's doing that, (laughs) okay? And yes, it's true, it's your kingdom, and you should be able to do whatever you want, but it's like a pull of horses. It just starts pulling you in its direction. Have you noticed? If it's attracted toward, it pulls you toward it. It doesn't want you to sit there and watch it. It wants to go where it wants to go and pull you there with it. If it's repulsed by something, it wants to go away from it. It doesn't want you sitting there watching it be repulsed. It wants to get out of here, right? And it has this, I like the force it has. It has this tremendous force, just like wind. It blows you away. It blew me away. I bet it did. And all these different energies, as they come up in you, see them as wind. See them as force fields. Try to draw you into them. And whatever vector they were trying to go in, they try to pull the whole of your being into that. If you do go with that, which is the normal human state, you get lost in it. And the next thing you know, you're yelling. And the next thing you know, you're running. And the next thing you know, you're doing something that is involved in that energy. And that's the normal human state. That those energies, when they come up, run you. They steal your life. Eventually, you will reach the point to where you have the ability to sit in pure consciousness, to sit in objective awareness in witness to where your consciousness no longer ever, I mean ever, never, you can't even remember the last time that your consciousness budged from its center. You just attain a seat inside to where none of the energies that are flowing down below you that you're watching have enough force to pull you out of that seat until eventually they don't even have enough force to start to pull you out of that seat. They're just flowing down underneath you and you're watching these things go by. That's witness consciousness. That's your seat of center. How do you get there? That's an absurd question. You are there. You just stay there. You just do not permit yourself to get pulled down into those energies. It's not hard. People want to say it's hard. You're standing there and somebody says something. You start to feel anxiety or anxiousness or resentment come up inside of you. It's strong. So... You're still there watching it. And then your mouth wants to mouth off and talk about the resentment and anger and frustration that you're feeling inside. Well, guess what? If you don't open your mouth, it ain't going to say squat. And it's yours. You're in charge. You're the boss. You get to sit in there despite the fact that this unwelcome guests of anxiety and the wind are blowing inside of you. And you learn to just sit. You sit there. You sit there. Watch them. Hello. Goodbye. And they will come up and they will pass right through you and go away. And you'll be so happy that you stayed in charge of yourself instead of permitting the flow of these energies to just take over your being. Once you are able to sit there 
It will get deeper and deeper and stronger and stronger until nothing can touch you. It only keeps touching you because you keep letting it. It will take as long as you want it to take. Now, if you suppress it, you'll be there forever. I intend to suppress it. The energies have the right to come up. You have the right to watch them. And that's your relationship. If you watch them instead of suppress them or go with them, they will go away. Not once. It'll take a few times, don't worry. But it doesn't matter. Once you achieve your seat and these things can't pull you out of your seat, who cares what they do? They're not going to affect your life. Now, the first thing you're going to see is that you're afraid of these things. You used to be afraid that your boyfriend would do this, your girlfriend would do this, or this would happen and that would happen. No, no. You're afraid of yourself. You're afraid that these energies will come up so strong that they'll destroy you and that you can't handle them and that you'll never be happy again for the rest of your life. They are like, they're what you're afraid of. When you learn to have the strength in the center to sit in your center of consciousness and permit the energies to come up, do not fight them, you let them come up and just pass through you, you will not only never lose your center, but you'll never be afraid of them again. They can't hurt you. They're just wind. It's just wind. Just enjoy it. Sometimes it makes your hair blow back. And sometimes it's calm. Who cares? As long as you are willing to be at peace, it will be at peace with you. And so you do that inside yourself. And the teachings are so simple. You sit in the seat of self, in the seat of consciousness, and you permit whatever must unfold inside of you to come up and go. And it will all come and go. It will not do anything. And eventually you will see that some very, very strong energies, there's some pretty strong energies in there, in case I forgot to mention it, that some very, very strong energies can come up and pass right through you. Things that you've been holding inside of you since you can remember that you were afraid to let come up and you didn't know what to do with them, and so you had to go do all it. You didn't have to do anything. Just let them come up. They're just energy. They're just release. And your consciousness is capable of sitting there while these energies come up and pass inside of you. Once you've been able to do this for a prolonged period of time with some very, very strong energies, like all your suppressed energies and all that junk you have in there, you will cease to be afraid of yourself. You will cease to be afraid of the energies that can come up because you realize all they're going to do is pass through me. What do I care? Stronger, weaker, what's the difference? I don't have to fight them. I just let them go. And once you're not afraid of your own energies, you will realize you're not afraid of life. All the fear of life will go away. Why? The only thing life can do is affect your inner energy flow. I mean, if life goes about its business and you're fine, what do you care? (laughs) Right? No matter what happens, if you're feeling love and joy and ecstasy and high well-being and enthusiasm, no matter what life does, why would you be afraid of life? It's only because you're afraid something's going to happen in life that's going to disturb you. When you can no longer be disturbed, life ceases to be a threat. It ceases to be that which could disturb you. And then all of a sudden, you're at peace with life. You're free. You freed yourself. You can be in the world, but not of it. You can just be here, and the world can unfold however it must. You'll find yourself never thinking about the future again. No matter what the future looks like, you won't think about it. Why? Because you don't care. It doesn't matter what it does, you'll be fine. How do you know? You've always been fine. Eventually, you've always been fine. And all that can happen is the energy will come up and pass through you, and that's fine. And you won't find yourself pondering the past either. Why? People ponder the past now because, oh, I could have done this, or I wish I had done that, or why did this have to happen? Why are they doing that? Because they're not okay. What if you are okay? If you are okay, who wants to think about the past? It has no purpose. It has no meaning. The only thing the past was is that which helped you be okay. That's not bad. That's a good past. <laughs> right? That which helped me be high. That which helped me feel love. That, you're not going to look back on it. You just honor it. You respect it. You wouldn't change a thing. A yogi would not change a thing about their past. Why? Because they're happy where they are. It took them to a place that they're pleased and it's getting better and better. So what is the past? A vehicle which helped carry them to a beautiful place. So don't ever resent your past or shame your past or wish you had idea. I mean, silly. It's just silly. If you are in a state of well-being, the future and the past fade away. You don't need one. You can just live in the now because you are contented with what's going on. 
if you are no longer afraid of what can come up inside of you, you will no longer be afraid of life. You know, it's neat as we talk about this. Remember the third Zen patriarch? I always quote you his first sentence, which was, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. But he also said, when a thing can no longer offend you, it ceases to exist in the old way. When an outside object can no longer create a disturbance inside of you that you're having problems with, your relationship with that object changes. You have problems with your parents because your parents can screw you up because they can cause those weird feelings to go on inside of you still or with your ex-husband or with whoever or whatever. It is not because of them in and of themselves. It's because of what they do inside of you, what happens inside of you in their presence. If a thing can no longer offend you, in other words, if that doesn't happen anymore, then it ceases to exist in the old way. Then your relationship with that object instantaneously changes completely. It's neat to watch. This is what it means to grow. It's real core level, beautiful stuff. And it's all based upon your willingness to work with the energies inside of you instead of hide from the energies inside of you by manipulating, controlling people, places, and things outside of you. And there's the path. You just cease, stop, give up on trying to manipulate people, places, and things outside of you, which will make all of your inner energies freak. That's like letting go of the crutches. You're going to find out where your broken legs are. You give up on that, and then you will feel the energies inside of you you've been hiding from, and just watch. Just experience the tornadoes and the hurricanes that go on inside of you and breathe and sit there and if you need to do yoga, do yoga. You need to meditate, meditate. You need to turn malabis, turn malabis. You need to do mantra, do mantra. Whatever you need to do. Do whatever it is you need to do in order to sit deep enough inside of you to where the energies that are coming up inside of you are free to just come and go. It's Grand Central Station and don't even guide the traffic. If they want to hit each other, let them hit each other. None of your business. You just enjoy the panorama. You just watch these energies come and go. All right? And once you can sit there and they can't bother you, then you can't be bothered. Because this world cannot bother you. It can only disturb the energies inside of you. And that's what bothers you. And when that no longer disturbs you, then your burden is light. That state that we just talked about, where there's always this beautiful energy that's flowing inside and you're always feeling an uplifting love supporting your heart, and your future and past have no particular meaning because you're fine in the present and your consciousness is capable of sitting in a state where all the energies that are flowing around inside of you are way down there below you and you're just watching them and you're staying centered, that is not the end of your spiritual journey. That is the start of your spiritual journey. From that seat, you have transcended your humanness. You're watching the human being be human, but you're not involved. It goes about its business, and you enjoy the movie, but you're deeply centered inside, and there's a peace that flows inside. As you spend enough time there, you will feel opening up behind you. The human is in front of you. All that stuff's in front of you. You'll see you watch it from above. You just watch it. It's down there. Even not later, now, if you watch your mind, you watch your heart, they're in front of you. This happens behind you. You start to feel an energy flow wake up behind you. You feel this rush of energy, this pull of chi, of shakti, of spirit, call it whatever you want. It starts to unfold inside of you and it starts to pull you up into it. That's the start of your true spiritual journey. Because that's spirit pulling inside. And it starts to pull you deeper and deeper. And you just keep going with it. You just keep letting go. And all the deeper spiritual experiences, the mystical deep experiences, come from your relationship with that energy flow. And it can take you way beyond. It is the only way to go beyond. Is riding those waves. Riding that river of shakti, of energy. 
So you have to decide what you want to do with your life. Door number one, you can squalor and beg and claw and hope and fear and grab and try to be okay. Door number two, (laughs) you can have the journey of your life. And just every moment of your life keep unfolding and expanding into the greatness that is incomprehensible that is your own being.